Yes. Here we are. Welcome to Cochin University of Science and Technology. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Cochin University of Science and Technology School of Industrial Fisheries. Now we have Dr. Richmond Law from Australia in SOFI 2020. International webinar, Sustainable Ornamental Fisheries Way Forward, SOFI Way Forward. Dr. Le Richmond Law will speak on diseases of cichlid, cichlid ornamental fishes and their treatment. Dr. Richmond is the fish vet, certified aquatic veterinarian and veterinary pathologist, fellow World Aquatic Veterinary Met Met Medical Association, senior adjunct at Mudoksh University. Dr. Law graduated from Mudoksh University in 2001. Dr. Law followed his passion of fish to take his first post as fish pathologist intern at DPIPW in Tasmania. His aquatic work encompassed salmonids, oyster, and abalone health monitoring and pathology. There, Dr. Law began consulting with pet fishes as the fish vet. Now based in Perth, he is joined by a team spread across Australia to provide veterinary and pathology services for a range of clients, including pet fish, display aquaria, retailers, and fish farmers. He has been admitted to the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Sciences by examinations in both subjects of pathobiology and in medicine and management of aquaculture species. He is a certified aquatic veterinarian and has been awarded the George Alexander International Well Fellowship by the International Specialized Skill Institute. He has been introduced, inducted as a fellow of the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. He promoted aquatic veterinary medicine by producing educational material too. Yes, a warm welcome to Dr. Richmond Law. Right, thank you, Minnie. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, what, what would you like me to say now? Sorry. Uh, we are streaming. We are going to start streaming your video. Okay. We, uh -huh. we talk after that. Hi, my name is Dr. Richmond Lowe and I'm the fish vet. Today I'm going to present to you a series about the diseases of cichlids. Now, a lot of other freshwater fish can develop the same conditions that cichlids can, but I'm just using cichlids as an example because I, I, there are a few more diseases that they can get that other fish do not develop, such as hole in the head. So we'll proceed with the presentation. Now, in terms of clinical signs of common fish diseases, I've listed a, I've prepared a table just to uh, allow you to compare and contrast. Down the left column, the first column here, I've got the common infectious diseases. And above here on the, on the first row are some of the clinical signs that I might show. And in the key, I've also provided how prominent it is. So if it's uh, uh, given a, th a level of three, it means you can sort of spot it with your naked eye. You can't uh, miss it. So for example, with fish lice, the pathogen is visible to the naked eye. It's very prominent. Uh, you can get increased mortalities. It's quite prominent uh, and, and so on and so forth. And I guess coming down to here, they do not produce uh, respiratory signs and do not breathe heavily or or anything like that. So that's why I've given it a score of zero. Um, if you compare uh, these values, it 
in terms of, I guess, with your external parasitic diseases, with your um, these microscopic ones, it becomes very difficult to try to um, differentiate with that uh, between them without actually using a microscope. So, uh, in the rest of this talk, what I'll show you is how you can use a microscope to be able to differentiate between the diseases so that you don't have to guess. Now, we mentioned before with the clinical science of common fish diseases, some people might look at this picture here on the left and say that's pop eye and over here we've got dropsy. So that's going to be a bacterial infection. Now, most it can't, you aren't always going to be wrong. However, to me, when I look at this, I see exophthalmia, there's a protrusion of the eye. And over here on the right, I see subcutaneous edema and ascites. What can cause these sorts of clinical signs? It's not always going to be bacterial infection. Of course, if there's uh, swelling on both sides of the eyes, you might think maybe it's a sort of inflammation behind the eye and causing that protrusion, but it can also be trauma. It can be due to gas bubble disease, or it may be due to some sort of a cancer, which we'll show you later on. And over here with dropsy, what's causing the abdomen, what's causing the subcutaneous edema and ascites, it could be something to do with osmoregulatory function. There's loss of it. Maybe there's something wrong with its gills. Maybe there's a skin disease or a kidney disease. It could be due to the bacterial infection causing septicemia kidney dysfunction and accumulation of body fluids, or it could be due to a tumor, um, back, um, some other bacterial infections or a virus. So we'll, we'll come to this in a short while. And same thing with hole in the head disease. Is it always due to hexameter or is it a multifactorial cause to causing this coalescing skin erosions that tend to be along the lateral line? Again, a trophious, a trophious bloat. Could it be that? Or could it be something else? Why do we want to know? Well, if we can break down what we're seeing based on clinical science, if we can break that down to what pathogen or what disease process is happening, uh, we can break that down to the causality. And why do we want to do that? Uh, if it's a bacterial or fungal Paris, um, pathogen, basically you want to know it because you want to be able to know what sort of category of drugs, um, what class of drugs you can use to treat the different categories of fish diseases, fish disease causing agents. So for example, if you have a fungal infection, you may want to use some sort of antifungal, uh, whereas if you are dealing with a protozoal parasite which is external, you can use something like formalin or potassium permanganate, um, whereas if it's a, an external a uh, helmet or a worm infection like a fluke, uh, then you want to go with something that's uh, more targeted towards that disease, like an antihelmintic, uh, perhaps Preziquantel for your flukes, uh, or trichlorophon or something similar to that. So I'm just showing you some of the cases that I deal with. More than 50% uh, of the of the cases I deal with are due to infectious diseases. So they've either purchased a fish or introduced a new fish to their fish tank or pond and diseases break out. Now, those of you who are working in the supply chain or in the ornamental industry, you will be dealing a lot with infectious diseases because you're basically getting fish um, sent to you from lots of different farms to a assembling uh, depot and then it might then be exported to another country. Uh, that country receives fish from multiple sources, goes then to another place and another place and so on and so forth. And in a retail system, uh, you, if you are sharing water from one tank to another in a bay type system, uh, recirculating aquatic system, then uh, diseases from one tank of fish could spread to a different tank. So you have to be aware and be on the lookout and be vigilant for infectious diseases. Water quality issues can also be a problem in a lot of backyard uh, and home aquaria and ponds. Uh, as I might expect, uh, retailers uh, may also encounter these things either in the shop or uh, with their customers. So it's good to uh, be aware of water quality issues. 
And as a veterinarian, I do also go out to house calls to remove tumors from fish as well. Now I'm going to start with some of the diseases. We're going to start with the smallest of uh, the diseases, then we'll progress on to the more obvious ones uh, later on. So to start off with, we'll start with viral diseases. This thing here, where you can see these clusters of white material uh, accumulating all over the body surfaces and very prominent, especially on the fins, it's a viral disease called lymphocystis. Um, what it causes is that it in the virus infects the fibroblasts, which are connective tissue cells, and they uh, pack them so much that they make the cells so big, full of virus particles, that you can actually see the individual cells as big as about half a millimeter to one millimeter in size. And these massively enlarged cells, uh, I guess they used to call them lymphocystis because they were round cells and they looked like lymphocytes, but later on they found that it's not actually the white blood cell, the lymphocytes that they're the virus is attacking, but in fact, they are attacking the fibroblasts. So, um, if you, it can look very similar to white spot disease, but they this disease tends to cluster a little bit more than white spot disease. Um, they tend not to have uh, the flashing or this extreme irritation that you expect to see with white spot disease protozoal parasite, and. The best way to be able to tell without having to guess is to actually put it down the microscope. So when you put it down the microscope, what you can see is these large cells that actually belong to the host. And because it's not a protozoal parasite, they don't actually move. So they're quite static. They just sit there and they don't do anything. Um, so that's how you differentiate them between white spot disease and the viral lymphocystis. Now, it's just a tip on how to use a microscope. If you initially put the, uh, a skin scrape of the lesion down a microscope, you'll see that it can be quite colorless um, and it be quite hard to visualize this, the um, cells. So what you do is you actually turn down the condenser um, and then that will sort of create a sort of a phase contrast effect and you'll be able to see this, these uh, infectious cells a lot more easily. Now with this viral disease, there's no real cure for it. Basically, you have to remove it from the system to stop and prevent it spreading even more. Another sort of quite closely related virus is the Megalocyte virus. It's also another type of um, iridovirus, but this one causes huge mortalities and it can cause neurological signs so fish can swim erratically it can lead to color changes especially in juveniles and you can get unexplained causes of mortalities that don't respond to any form of treatment and this disease as you can see it's not confined to any particular group of fish but it can affect all sorts of cichlids all your life bearers and also your labyrinth breathers and because it has been shown to uh, be um, one of our native Australian fish, the Murray cod, it's been shown that it's also highly susceptible to this disease. Um, the Murray cod being the, our largest freshwater fish in Australia, um, and also it's endangered in the wild, and it's also a commercially uh, important food aquaculture species. Um, the Australian government has made moves since 2015 to try and exclude this from entering our country. So what sort of damage does it cause in fish? Basically, it attacks again uh, your fibroblasts, your connective tissue cells, and also uh, your hematopoietic cells, the, the blood producing organs. So over here, you can see the intestine. The intestine is markedly expanded with these large cells, the heart as well. You can see inclusion uh, bodies here. This is your kidney, your kidney tubules. And you can see these uh, cells, which are packed full of the viral particles. And you can see also necrosis, pycnosis, and of the um, hematopoietic cells. And over here, the splenic tissue, the spleen as well, is pretty much shot. So it does eventually cause them um, immunosuppression they can show lots of different types of diseases, but 
it's incurable so if you do get this through your system basically all species uh, your light bearers cichlids and your labyrinth breathers if they are sharing the same system basically you would expect that they will all become infected so it's something that you have to be aware of and in australia it's reportable so if that uh, occurs in your system then all those uh, susceptible species will need to be eradicated now on to something a little bit bigger bacterial diseases these tend to cause quite high mortalities and they usually be able to be treated with a variety of antibiotics for which the speech uh, the bacteria strain are susceptible to with a why I say that is that um, you can't always just grab an antibacterial off the shelf and know that it's going to work 100%. And the reason for that is that bacteria can carry antibiotic resistant genes uh, and they can also pass it on from one bacteria to another. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be the same species of bacteria. And what I found is that for clients where they have had use of a variety of antibiotics the bacterial infections that happen in their uh, facilities tend to be worse and they tend to be multi-drug resistant so uh, in those cases uh, you really need to run bacterial culture and antibiotic sensitivity testing at a laboratory uh, so that you can know what sort of antibiotic is going to work in that particular situation so with flavor bacteria, it's also known as uh, saddleback disease because sometimes the bacteria starts um, invading just behind the dorsal fin. Um, and what you can see is that it actually produces enzymes that break down the skin epithelium. And what you're left with is either exposed bone or exposed dermis. And that's why it looks a bit white uh, as it takes away all the... Um, pigmented cells. If you were to do a scrape of the lesion, put it down a microscope, and then if you were to stain it, you can use, uh, in the veterinary uh, circles, we use diff quick stain. Uh, however, if you don't have access to that, you can actually use blue food coloring, and you can dye uh, the material, give it a quick rinse, and you'll see these stacks of filamentous, long, uh, slender bacterial rods. With Aromonas, uh, Aromonas hydrophila being one of the most common one, hydrophila, hydro meaning water and phila meaning uh, liking. Uh, so it's basically in every freshwater environment. You can even get it out of your tap. Um, and at, in certain uh, circumstances, if fish are stressed, immunosuppressed, or if they sustain skin wounds, maybe from rough handling during grading or transport and things like that, uh, they can have breaks in the skin and then these would become portals of infection uh, where the bacteria can come in and then cause a dermatitis and then a septicemia. So with a lot of aquatic animals, uh, especially fish, uh, if they get a skin infection, it can lead to septicemia. So we tend, uh, it's very common, so we tend to group them together and we, we say uh, the whole disease process being dermatoseptisemia, dermo meaning skin, and septicemia as in going into the bloodstream. Another disease you can get, which is a bacterial disease, is mycobacteria onocardia. Now, if you get this disease though, there's no treatment possible. Uh, there can be different uh, species of mycobacteria and they can attack and cause death as quickly as within a month. Uh, but generally speaking, a lot of these diseases tend to take months to appear. So if you are running a wholesale or a retail system, uh, you may get the occasional deaths uh, in a system that is filled with mycobacteria, but you wouldn't expect to see uh, a lot of deaths um, and the mycobacteria tend to sort of raise its head more uh, noticeably in home aquaria uh, where they have just that one system and they're introducing more and more fish if they're not uh, doing good husbandry, not doing good vac uh, gravel vacuums and not um, doing uh, getting rid of all the organics from their 
uh, by a filter regularly, uh, then this sort of bacteria can build up in systems and cause death of your fish. The clinical signs that you might present uh, with mycobacterial infection can range in a variety of ways. It can be um, sort of becoming skinny, uh, losing weight. You can get skin ulcers if that's the primary organ. Uh, you can get diarrhea, so fish might produce um, feces that might be stringy uh, if it's attacking the intestine. If it's attacking the brain, they can be swimming in a spiral motion. And if it's attacking the kidneys, you can present with dropsy. Uh, so I've got a video on my YouTube channel. You can look it up uh, and it shows you all the different uh, clinical presentations with videos and photos uh, of, of these fish with mycobacterial infections. Now, one thing you have to be very important to say is that mycobacteria is actually zoonotic. It's actually a zoonotic disease. So um, if you have a tank or a facility that has mycobacteria, um, the people who work with that, with that, those fish and fish tanks, uh, you, they will be, uh, it will be possible for them to contract the disease in their skin, uh, which would require surgical removal and probably a course of antibiotics, which would be prescribed by your doctor. So if you get any sort of uh, lumps and bumps on your skin, uh, if you deal with fish a lot, then um, make sure you tell your, your doctor about this uh, disease and then they can investigate further. So yeah, we, we've talked about flavor bacteria. It tends to occur uh, due to traumatic injuries to the skin, a poor environment with a high suspended solid. So here again is your saddleback disease. It's occurring behind the dorsal fin uh, and it's sort of eating away at the flesh. So here we're sort of starting to see uh, exposed muscle with the redness there. So I'll just show you some videos of how, uh, it, how I guess, a dead or dying fish looks uh, when they're exposed, when they're getting septicemia. So this is an angel fish. This is a diff quick stain. You can see these tiny uh, short uh, rod, bacterial rods uh, amongst the, the blood film. And here you can see uh, another common spot uh, for uh, skin ulcer formation is sort of behind the pectoral fin. Okay, so whenever you get a sort of skin ulcers, I guess it's not always due to bacteria. It may be due to external parasites uh, like skin flukes. But if you are going to use um, antibiotics, it's always important to consider running bacterial culture and antibiotic sensitivity testing. And it can prove to be very useful, especially if you've got high value species or you've got a huge uh, amount of fish in that same aquatic, uh, recirculating aquatic system. Uh, so it pays to actually be able to find out which antibiotic is the best one to use in any particular case. What sort of sample do you need when you're sampling for bacteria? Uh, basically, if you have a skin ulcer, you want to sort of scratch a bit of the, um, the sort of debride the external um, ulcer a little bit and take a swab from the leading edge. So this sort of the periphery of the um, ulcers because that's where the bacteria that's causing disease is actively growing and spreading. Uh, if you, whereas if you take, were to take a sample, say for example, right in the middle here, uh, it's already been and gone and you might get just environmental contaminants which aren't actually the primary pathogen. So you, what you want to do is you want to take a sample from the outside. If you're able to do necropsies of fish, um, then the ideal sample would be of the kidney. And if you have fish, uh, that are really valuable. You don't want to be euthanizing it. Say, for example, a broodstock, highly prized broodstock koi. For example, you may want to take a uh, blood sample uh, from the tail vein and swab that and send that to the lab for testing. You can also do a fine needle aspirate if it's like an abscess type or not, um, 
forming, you can take a fine needle aspirate with a needle and syringe with the fish under anesthesia, and then take a swab of that. If the fish is having a diarrhea type thing, then you would want to take a swab of the feces. You probably want to um, have the fish, yeah, you want the fish to be anesthetized, and then you would take a swab directly from the vent um, uh, rather than sampling the feces itself. When you're sending stuff to the laboratory, you would also want to help us prepare some glass slides and a cytology of it. Make sure it's fully dried before you submit that to the lab with your swab uh, because they may want to run some special stain. So here's a Diffquick stain, a Gram stain, and a Zeal Nielsen stain, and it helps them with their interpretation. So here, this example here is from an axolotl, and it has um, mycobacterial infection. So on a Diffquick stain, um, it doesn't actually stain the bacteria itself. The mycobacteria has got a thick waxy wall, so it doesn't take up the stain. However, we stain with the gram stain, um, again, with its th thick waxy wall, it doesn't always stain uh, gram positive. It's actually quite variable, and you, you don't, quite a lot of them in, is in the background and non-staining. But if you run a ZN stain, which uses heat uh, to be able to help the carbol fusion, the red color, um, soak into the waxy wall it, and you acid wash that, uh, you see that they come up nice and red. So they call acid fast bacilli um, because they take up the stain and it doesn't wash off. So the other thing, um, I guess why I always send um, swabs to for testing at the laboratory is I want to know what antibiotic I can use. And here's a, an example of how the antibiotics uh, are tested. They actually put little discs of antibiotic impregnated discs onto the, uh, onto the agar plate and they spread the bacteria that they think is the primary pathogen. And if there's a large zone of inhibition where the bacteria don't actually grow, uh, it's more likely that that antibody is going to be useful in your situation. So here's an example of a table of different antibiotics that they might run at the laboratory. But if you have a look at here, uh, I guess the most common um, antibiotics that you may find in your fish store may be amoxicillin, your doxycycline, maybe your triple sulfurs and your tetracycline. You can see that in, in this particular case, your tetracycline is not going to be useful to treat this particular um, bacteria, but you can use your triple sulfur and your trimethoprim sulfur. So more about mycobacteria. We mentioned a little bit more about it before. Um, now, if this is an Oscar here, you can see that the mycobacteria causes granulomas and sort of an abscess type uh, infection in the swim bladder. And because of this, this is why this Oscar here is lying on the bottom, uh, being hypobuoyant and sitting on the, on the floor. And you can see the, it's also uh, losing a bit of weight and the liver here, you can see little spots where the bacteria have set up here. So this is a granulomatous infection um, causing the fish to be lying on the floor. Now here's another one where you can get a lump forming on, this, on the bottom lip. If you do a histology section, uh, you may not see very much apart from a lot of uh, proud flesh or fibrous tissue. But if you run a ZN stain, you can see within some of these, uh, white blood cell uh, clusters, you can see these little red rods, bacterial rods, and these are mycobacteria. Again, in this epistogramma here, you can see little lesions on the gill covers and on, on its body. If you do a skin scrape, this is a diff quick stain, you can see these non-staining rods. And if you apply your ZN stain, you'll see that they come up bright uh, red rods. So these are uh, 
mycobacteria. So the short link to my YouTube video about mycobacteria is tinyurl.com slash tfv for the fish vet slash uh, dash tb for uh, I guess fish tuberculosis is one of the common names. Now, we can also get some sort of a bacterial infection on histology. We, we can see them occasionally. This is epitheliocystis. Uh, it sort of forms these blue bodies. Uh, we see them quite often in gills. It doesn't cause any real diseases in most cases. Uh, however, if we see a lot of these, it tends to sh tell you that the environment that the fish is living in is not optimal. Okay, we'll move on to a different category of diseases, which is fungal infection. Now, fungal infections tend to occur and affect fish that are immunosuppressed or have skin uh, damage. Here is a ram cichlid uh, with a sort of this white tuft on its dorsal fin. If you were to do a skin scrape and look at it down a microscope on wet preparation, you can see these non-septate hyphae and at the end here are the sporangia. These ones are the reproductive bits where they will burst out with little um, fungal spores that will go out, swim and attack another fish. Now with this one, um, you can treat with potassium permanganate or a malachite green uh, solution. And, and this is uh, malachite green. You have to be very careful what you use it on because it is banned for use in any fish uh, that would enter the food chain. And it has been banned for probably more than 40 years now. Uh, but in the ornamental industry, uh, it is still widely used. The reason why it's banned is because it's carcinogenic. It's in uh, it can cause cancer. So uh, whenever you, you are using this or whenever you are selling this product as a retailer, uh, you have to warn the owners uh, to wear personal protective equipment, make sure they wear gloves, don't touch the um, solution, um, the, especially the neat solution that comes out of the bottle and also uh, reduce your exposure to the treated water as well. So with saprolegnia, I mentioned before, it, causes, uh, it attacks fish that are immunosuppressed. So it can happen quite often uh, with tropical fish uh, where the, the heating might have gone, might have been broken uh, or with cold water uh, species where uh, you might enter into summer and it gets too warm for them, the immune system gets suppressed. The other thing with fungal infection is that it can also affect fish that have been exposed to too much antibiotics, um, bacteria, non-pathogenic bacteria, the, the bacteria that don't cause disease that normally live on the skin of fish is actually protective uh, against fungal infections like this. So if you're using antibiotics, uh, if you have overuse of antibiotics, you can actually uh, lead to uh, fungal infections. Now we'll move on to algal infections. Uh, udinium is their old name. Now it's called pisk udinium. It's an actually a infectious algal disease. And these algae can actually swim and attack fish. And if it is an algal disease, then the treatment of choice would be copper sulfate. And you can see if on a skin scrape, uh, these cells, they tend not to move. And also, they have all these golden type chloroplasts. Uh, these chloroplasts are also photosynthetic. So as part of the treatment, you want to also reduce lighting uh, to the affected tank so that uh, algal cells do not have a, a different means of generating energy. A very rare one, a, an invasive algal um, pathogen is the chlorochytrium and they've only ever I guess been described I've only ever seen it in a journal article and I've not seen it in in, in real life myself uh, and they cause invasive disease now with invasive diseases it's going to be very difficult to cure um, possibly impossible to cure as well so 
Uh, if you do get this diagnosis, basically you have to eradicate that from your system. Uh, euthanize the fish and add some sort of uh, copper sulfate into the water to prevent these algal spores from being able to survive in the water column to be able to infect another fish. Now we're moving on to something a little bigger, more towards the animal world, is the protozoa infections. Chyla donella is a protozoal parasite, they're ciliated protozoa, and with ciliated protozoa, they tend to move in a nice smooth fashion, and they change directions and so on and so forth. And these are sort of uh, uh, not a complete circle or a, a, a uniform oval shape, and they will have parallel lines of cilia here. Chyla donella uh, tend to affect fish, especially those that are sort of living down the bottom. Uh, and in ponds, when there's low dissolved oxygen. Uh, so you have to make sure that you get good water circulation to be able to, to reduce the amount of Chyla donella in your system. In fish that are affected it, you can see that they might have clamped fins, erosions of, um, or melting of the fins. Here you can get skin ulcer formation as well, and the fish just don't look very well. It's not a specific clinical sign to color donella, but these are some signs that you look for to, to, um, to identify your fish as being sick and needing further investigation. Now, ichthyobodo infection, um, it, it is, oops, um, let's see, sorry about that. With ichthyobodo infection, again, it is no specific clinical signs. You'll see that the fish is sort of, um, it's got more, uh, It's sort of wobbling from side to side. You can see he's weak. He's got clam fins and frayed fins. In this picture here, you can see we've got some uh, redness to the skin, which is uh, skin and fin congestion. If you were to look at that down the microscope, just take a skin scrape, you can see this lawn of tiny flagellated protozoa. And this is caused by ichthyobodo. Uh, it used to be called costia. And they're really, really tiny. You need to use your 40 times objective lens on your microscope to be able to see this really clearly. They're actually smaller than your red blood cells in the fish. Another protozoal infection is your white spot disease. As I mentioned before, it's quite obvious when they have the white spots, but if you are catching the disease earlier on, it's going to be quite difficult to see. So in this Oscar, for example, you don't really see the white spots, but what you see instead is the beginnings of the head and lateral line uh, erosions called hole in the head disease. So uh, hole in the head disease in this case is due to white spot disease. And I've got a really good YouTube video, tinyurl.com slash TFV WSD. You can see videos and pictures of fish presenting with white spot disease. Uh, in this case here, you can see your discus. They're really looking very sick, gone really dark. A lot of mucoid patches all over its body. And in this trophies, basically you don't really see any signs apart from death. Uh, when you're taking skin scrape from the trophies, you actually have to take the skin scrape from the caudal peduncle near the base of the tail, because uh, that's sort of where the mucousy part of the fish is, the whole body. Uh, the rest of the body, you tend not to be able to uh, take much uh, or get much sample from that. And you also take a gill biopsy uh, to be able to examine the gills. And if you were to look at it down the microscope, basically you'll get a lot of... Um, uh, press play. You'll see them sort of these large uh, trophons sort of moving around and you can see the red blood cells of the fish that is part of this uh, gill biopsy the sort of sort of jiggling around. So that's white spot disease. White spot disease, uh, you can 
treat by various means. Uh, you can use formalin, malachite green, formalin by itself if you are dealing with species that might be sensitive to malachite green. Or you can use thermal manipulation where you increase the water temperature between 30 to 32 degrees Celsius, hold that for about two to three days, and that's supposed to interfere with the white spot disease's ability to replicate and, and reproduce. Now, a word of warning, a word of caution when you're using thermal manipulation is that if the fish are already severely stressed, they have severe gill infestation that they can't breathe properly, increasing the water temperature would put enormous stress on them because it lowers the dissolved oxygen and if with the gills if they're already unable to breathe properly and, and you do that to them uh, this is what you end up with a bucket of dead fish another protozoal infection is your tetrahymena it used to be called uh, guppy killer disease and the reason for that is it used to be very common in guppies, but it can uh, occur in a variety of fish species as well. So if you have a look at this video, you can actually see how they invade. They're highly deformable and here, and then they split into two very quickly and they spread. So these Protozoal parasites, they're ciliated protozoa. You can see by the, by the way they move. They're very smooth in the way that they move. But because they're so deformable, they actually enter uh, tiny areas of ulcers in the fish. So in this case here, you can see this discus. These tiny little ulcers is how they enter the body. And this corridor right here from the same system. And they just feast on, on the fish. You can see the fins are all melting away because they're all invading and munching away. So these parasites can enter the body through these tiny things. The fish can still look alive and they can actually be uh, burrowing and eating the fish from the inside out while the fish is alive. They can find them in the liver, in the kidney, even in the brain and spinal cord of living fish uh, that are going to die. There is no treatment available for tetrahymena because a lot of our antiprotozoal treatments are what we put into the water. So it relies on direct exposure of the poison to the parasite. Whereas with, um, with tetrahymena, because they've gone into the body, the, the, the formalin is not able to enter the body and, and to kill the parasite that way. So in this case, it's very important that you identify any small lesions in any fish and you have to remove them from the population. Um, otherwise, it's just going to brew up and create more and more, amplify uh, the number of parasites in there and start attacking all your other fish. Now with flagellated protozoa, there are a few types. There's one uh, that has the hexameter that everyone points to as causing hole in the head disease. There is also the one that causes trophious bloat that live inside the intestines. Uh, you can see here a histology section of the intestine of this trophius. You can see the little flagellated protozoa. Um, it's quite hard to diagnose by histology, but if you were to say freshly euthanase one that's affected, you take its intestines and you look at that directly under the microscope, you can see this massive uh, sea of flagellated protozoa just buzzing around inside the intestines. Another one that you get is cryptobia. Now cryptobia is due to uh, another flagellated protozoa and it tends to be confined to and it tends to attack the, the stomach mucosa and uh, lamina propria where it can cause indigestion, uh, poor absorption of nutrients and the fish can go thinner and thinner and they may die from from that or they may die from secondary bacterial infections. Uh, so this one can only really be diagnosed uh, in fish after post-mortem examination and histology examination. With these things uh, you can 
Well, I guess with hexameter and trophius, you can treat with metronidazole or dimetridazole, uh, whereas with cryptovia, uh, there's no real treatment available. But I am trying to uh, uh, trialing the injectable metronidazole uh, as a way to treat uh, cryptovia. Okay, so the next larger parasite is your skin flukes or your, your flukes. Um, you can get two types of flukes. One is the skin fluke and the other one is the gill fluke. With the skin flukes, you can see that they have no eye spots and they have these large haptors. And an uh, interesting uh, thing about them is the way they reproduce and this is what distinguishes them from your gill flukes. You can see inside here in the uterus is another baby fluke. Now, inside the baby fluke, if you are unlucky or your fish is highly unlucky, inside the baby fluke, you might see another baby fluke. So it's like those little Russian dolls where you uh, pop open one and that's another one inside and then another one inside. And the, we mentioned before, uh, this is your, is your gill fluke. So we'll show you a video of the gill flukes. Now with the gill flukes, they tend to infest your gills and they, uh, the grazing action, it can cause chronic anemia. So this gills should look like tomato sauce red, but this is very pale. So here you can see they move around like leeches. You can see the tiny eye spots on, on this end here. Uh, they are a little bit smaller than your skin flutes. Now these gill flutes, they reproduce by laying eggs. Why is it important uh, to be able to tell the difference between the two is that if you're dealing with your skin flutes that produces live young, you usually only need to treat uh, with one, one single treatment of medication should be able to eradicate uh, your skin flutes, whereas with your gill flutes, because of their egg laying ability, the egg case actually protects the, the worms, uh, the baby worms from the medicine. And then um, once the medicine is sort of broken down, it hatches out and it's able to kill your fish again. So you'll have to treat the, the aquarium or your system multiple times to be able to eradicate gill flutes within the system. Now, in terms of treatment for flukes, uh, you can use an trichloroform or formalin or praziquantel. This one, this slide here, I put that in just to show you that um, gill flukes don't always occur on the gills and skin flukes not always on the skin. Here in this situation, this uh, discus tank here, you can see I, I was able to obtain a gill fluke, which have these eye spots, the egg laying ones from a skin scrape. So this is the edge of a cover slit and this is your skin scrape. And from your gill biopsy, I was able to find a skin fluke in the gills. So uh, I guess uh, this is why I guess we, we tend not to call it skin flukes and gill flukes, but we just use the, the uh, scientific names. This is dactylogyrus. Um, and this is your gyrodactylus, the life bearing gyrodactylus. Other things you can see uh, in terms of worms, these ones are now your round worms, also known as nematodes. Your flat worms, your flukes before, they are known as trematodes. Uh, trematodes, you use anthelmintics that work against flatworms like praziquantel, whereas with your nematodes, your roundworms, you treat them with uh, classes of drugs uh, like your levamazole, piperazine, and possibly your ivermectins. Now, why it's called roundworms is because if you do a cross-section of them, they are round. The camelanus are these red worms that protrude from the vent of fish and they're pretty large relatively to the size of the fish and they produce their oviviviparous they produce eggs that contain infectious larvae now fish can be infected by uh, ingesting uh, these larvae 
you know, as fish sort of go around and they math different things, they might math other fish's uh, feces and they might accidentally ingest this and then they will become infected themselves. They can also get this through uh, ingestion of your um, copepods as well. So things like brine shrimp or daphnia, they, they may introduce this to your tank. So I guess in terms of treatment, you can use your anthelmintics to treat them. Uh, and a way of preventing them, uh, you may want to either prophylactically treat certain species that are highly prone, uh, such as your live bearers and some of your cichlids uh, to these worms, and also possibly um, not feed them live foods. So this is a histological image of the sort of damage it causes. You can see here, this is what a normal intestine should look like. But here you can see the worm attaching to the mucosa. Uh, and you can see the lumen is just full of inflammatory cells. Uh, not in the lumen, sorry, in the, in the wall of the intestine. It's so much more thicker and it's fully infiltrated with inflammatory cells. And here is a section through a one of the eggs with the uh, larvae uh, ready to infect fish. Another kind of worm you may see is your camelanus or capillaria worm. And if you had to examine feces down the microscope, you'll see these lemon-shaped also oval things with the bipolar caps. This is typical for capillaria. You can see in this tank that's affected by capillaria, your pistogramma has gone very skinny uh, because it's not eating enough food to be able to cope with it. However, with your angelfish here, um, because it's more aggressive at feeding and eats a lot, it's not lost any body condition. However, his feces, you can see it's sort of like a, it, almost an invisible string, sort of a transparent string of feces. And this is typical of gut disease, uh, fish with an enteritis. Uh, it can be caused by bacteria, uh, but in this case, it's caused by the capillaria worm. So it's causing him some diarrhea. Yeah, so if you examine that string of feces down the microscope, this is what you can find. Some fish produce different kinds of, of feces. Uh, this one tends to produce a lumpier kind. It should be a dark brown, dark black uh, feces in most fish that are fed and they're fully digesting the food. Uh, whereas this one is sort of a more knobbly type. And, and in this case here, you can see the, the doesn't matter what species of fish you're dealing with, the worm eggs look very similar. Um, there's a YouTube video about this case, uh, tinyurl.com slash tfb dash gut worm. Other worms you can get are internal ones, um, and they are sort of like diagenetic trematodes. Um, they don't cause disease in the fish, uh, but they typically, they're called diagenetic, meaning that they need to go through multiple host uh, types uh, to be able to fully complete the life cycle. So they're usually an invertebrate, is the first host, then a fish eats it, then they develop an encyst here, in this case, at the base of the primary gill um, filaments. You can see these um, trematodes here. And then usually they require a bird to eat them. And then uh, the bird will defecate the infectious material, which will then infect your um, invertebrate host, like a copepod or a snail. And then the whole life cycle for that parasite goes again. Uh, most of the time, it doesn't cause any disease in the fish, it's just some sort of incidental thing that you find. And it's usually more uh, in wild caught species where there are that multiple uh, hosts that are sort of in, in, involved in the life of the fish. Now we'll move on to uh, nutritional causes. Uh, so we've completed, I guess, all the infectious common infectious ones, uh, but we'll come into some of the sort of interesting nutritional causes. Uh, may not be very common, but it just goes to show you how important it is to feed your fish well. 
Otherwise, they'll lose weight, they'll lose condition. And it's very important in the ornamental industry that you do feed the fish properly because they are going through a lot of stress going from farm to, um, to a distribution center, to a wholesaler, to a retailer, and then to a person's house. So you, you want to be able to feed the fish really well at every stage as much as possible. So we've got a case here with some, a variety of tanks in this facility where the fish are show, presenting with sort of a gaunt appearance. They're very skinny and thin. However, there were no mortalities, which were very interesting. And then if you go and ask them, what are they feeding it? A lot of fish have got specialized nutritional needs. And you have a look at here and they say, oh yeah, they're being fed a variety of specialized foods, which is really good. So why are they still dying? So I do basically a full water quality testing, skin scrape, Gilbert, um, Gilbert C microscopic examination. I find no problems at all. And then I decide that we probably should take a couple of these fish to euthanize, to do some necropsy and testing. And you can see here, uh, these are two fish um, with the electric yellow. You can see that it's really fairly pale skin, uh, pale gills. Uh, and then you can see the concave appearance to the, to the guts. And when you do, uh, when you open them up, you can see the intestines, it's just full, full of fluid, very similar to that tropheous bloat intestine. Uh, but what you notice here in the stomach, is full of this pink and white food. Now, it's showing that it's eating, which is good, but what is this pink and white food and why is the gallbladder so big and full? Usually when a gallbladder of fish is big and full, it's because it hasn't been eating very well or it's not being given the food that is specific to its dietary requirements. And in this case, it is that they were feeding them. I'll just show you a video of, of the fish. Um, they were actually feeding them the koi food. So if we move back to here, you can see this is the pellets pink and, and white. So this is what the people had been feeding these fish. Now koi food, the percentage protein is probably quite low, around a 30% um, area. But, and you can tell that when you smell the fish food, you can smell uh, the difference between a tropical um, carnivorous type fish food compared to a, an, a more herbivorous to an omnivorous diet. When you smell a tropical carnivorous fish food, you can smell it smells very fishy. Uh, it's got a nice fishy fragrance to it, whereas um, some of the poorer quality uh, fish foods, um, which the people tend to feed to um, koi and goldfish, you can smell it sort of smells more like oatmeal or, or some or a flour, uh, more like that. So yeah, so that was the problem. Uh, they were feeding low grade koi food to these uh, fish for more than nine months. And basically two years later, when they're back onto their supposed diets, um, they, they regain their body nutritional condition score. And one thing uh, that has to be said that uh, in the past, uh, there's always this problem with maintaining optimal water quality conditions. And people stress that so much. And the reason for that in the past is that the biofilters uh, technology and all that wasn't quite there. And so they stress that you should not overfeed your fish. And a lot of people nowadays, they, they, they have that sort of, sort of hammered into, into their minds uh, that people unknowingly are underfeeding their fish. So um, people may take their water sample at, to the fish shop and they test it and say, oh, no ammonia, no nitrite. And the nitrate is pretty much negligible, almost zero. And the fish shop people uh, not knowingly saying, oh, that's perfect, whatever you're doing, just keep doing that. Uh, and your fish would be healthy and you wouldn't um, have any deaths. However, 
um, over time, over a long time, uh, they can lose uh, their body condition and it can lead to immunosuppression and then uh, disease can happen. And the only way to tell that is actually to actually be able to see the fish, ask them how much they feed them as well and what they feed them. Ideally, what you want to feed them on is about half a percent to two percent of their total body weight every day. Uh, some of these owners have been feeding them maybe a fraction of their daily requirements uh, over two to three years and, and this can result. So um, if you go to my YouTube channel, tinyurl.com slash tfv dash feed amount, A-M-T, uh, you'll be able to see how we do this. Basically, we weigh the fish and then you weigh the food that you're supposed to feed them and then you show the owner this is how much you should be feeding them. A word of caution though, then when you're increasing the amount that you're going to feed them, you have to do that gradually because your biofilter may not be adapted to that uh, higher uh, biological load with a feed. So you've got to do that probably slowly over a month. Keeping an eye on the ammonia and the nitrite, making sure you don't get new tank syndrome. Now you can also get tumors, as I mentioned before, the pop eye appearance may not always be due to bacterial diseases. Uh, if it is a tumor, it tends to be unilateral, just one eye affected rather than both eyes. And in this case, we've got lymphoma uh, in the eye. Yeah, so you can remove the eye under anesthesia, give it post-operative uh, uh, analgesia as well, and they'll recover very well. One thing with Oscars is that it's very common for them to develop a kidney cancer. Now, there's no treatment for this. It can present as a, a single-sided or a both-sided um, swelling uh, to the abdomen area, or uh, it can be sort of high up, or it can also sort of move down its body. Um, now, this fish here um, is still alive, but it's got this kidney tumor uh, happening here. So it's lost uh, its ability to eat uh, and in this case it's really advanced. There's not, no uh, cure for it so euthanasia is the best uh, option. On histology uh, of the tumor you can see that they have sort of these sort of kidney tubules but they're massively uh, dysplastic. We've got accumulation of uh, materials, uh, all sorts of things in here and mineralization and basically the kidney has uh, stopped functioning properly. You can also get a variety of skin tumors. Uh, you can get sort of epithelial type and you can also get iridophoromas forming. You can see these sort of uh, crystals of, um, of uh, crystals uh, within the cells that give them that sort of metallic sheen to them. Now here is one where you've got traumatic injury, you've got uh, the eye with hemorrhage and swelling. Uh, here's your sort of granulation tissue here and here's your sucker mouth uh, catfish attacking this flower horn. Environmental diseases I mentioned before with the exophthalmia, with the pop eye appearance. This one doesn't actually have the pop eye but you can actually see that we've uh, got a uh, gas bubble forming is uh, quite shiny inside the eye uh, and here we've got the um, gas emboli blocking and clogging up the blood uh, blood flow through the gills and causing disease there and this one is due to gas supersaturation um, due to extensive high uh, photosynthesis like too much oxygen being produced into the water and causing that in the fish. So you gotta, if you're having fish in your planted aquarium, you gotta make sure that you maintain balance. Here we've got a case of um, acidic water causing your crebensis uh, to present with neurological signs of illness. It's sort of swimming in a in an abnormal way, and we found that there was a an ornament that was purchased and put into an aquarium that did not belong in an aquarium. So you've got to be very careful that people do not add things 
uh, that they did not buy from an aquarium store. So it's very important. I always stress that if you're going to buy anything that you're going to put into an aquarium, make sure that it comes from an aquarium store. Uh, there was some sort of a resin type pottery thing that caused the um, extreme acidity. And this is after removing, you can see the fish have all recovered. Extreme acidity can also present in different ways depending on what species. This is an African flagfish. Uh, American flagfish can see uh, redness in the abdomen. Here you can see excess mucus with spectacle uh, formation in the discus. And, uh, yeah. and then here you can see this Oscar is just really not feeling well, lying on its side and uh, developing hole in the head disease. Now, this one I think uh, you should watch in its entirety. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, tinyurl.com slash TFV dash acid food. Uh, basically, this is like, what, why is it that these uh, Altum angels are going off their food and dying? Um, and they're just being fed your normal fish food, which everyone feeds them, mosquito larvae. It's the staple live food for most uh, aquarium keepers. Why is it that they were dying from it? And basically, we worked out it's due to uh, a low environmental pH in which the fish were raised. However, uh, the mosquito larvae were actually raised in harder water, which meant that the spikes and bristles uh, became dangerous objects that the fish were ingesting, causing uh, granulomatous gastritis and esophagitis and death. This is also another interesting thing to do with environmental um, conditions. Uh, in this fish tank, the owner was keeping three different types of African reef lake cichlids and he was finding that the Lake Victorian ones somehow kept on uh, becoming thin and then were also dying as a as an as a result of that, uh, we worked out lots of the things. We excluded a lot of things. And finally, we were able to find out that there was actually excess magnesium uh, in the water that caused this. How did he get excess magnesium? Basically, uh, they were using uh, an off-the-shelf um, range of salts for uh, African cichlids. And, and basically, they were using too much of it. I guess it was sufficient for something like your Lake Tanganyika, but it was way in excess of for your Lake Victorian one. So if you have a look at the tinyurl.com slash TFV dash MG for magnesium, uh, you'll be able to watch that video and see how we investigate and came to that conclusion. Hypothermia can happen in winter in Australia. Uh, in quite a few parts in Australia because it gets quite cold. And a typical sign of hypothermia can happen with your betters quite frequently when people forget that they need heating uh, because in the fish shops, they don't, uh, most people don't see the heating elements and things like that because they're in a system, um, in a flow through system, uh, in a recirculating system. Uh, people don't realize that they need a heater. But uh, the fish that tend, they tend to de um, develop hunger and they're unable to metabolize that food. So they tend to um, present with this sort of pot belly appearance. And this one has been a fairly chronic uh, case of hypothermia being cold. And you can see here this female one here on the fire mass cichlid is developing hole in the head disease. Okay, so um, yeah, we'll just skip that there. Just running a little bit out of time. Basically, the investigation process that I go with is uh, I follow this in this order. So we, I always collect history from the owner. I test the water parameters, uh, namely ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, pH, alkalinity, water temperature, general hardness, and maybe your phosphate and salinity. I assess the aquatic system, making sure that the sumps and everything is all working properly. Um, I assess the feed and the husbandry, whether how often they're changing the water, cleaning the filtration. I examine the filter material itself. 
And then after that is when I start examining the fish. I check the clinical signs and I do some wet mount examination of gill biopsies and skin micro scrapes. And usually more than 80% of the time I'm able to uh, arrive at a diagnosis and be able to start the treatment right there and then. Uh, in the a few cases where perhaps there was a bacterial or a viral infection, uh, sampling for laboratory testing becomes necessary. So uh, you can see from some of my YouTube um, presentations, I show you uh, where I do use uh, the laboratory testing, where I perform histopathology uh, and other things like that to arrive at the diagnosis. So yeah, so that's the diagnostic process and I hope you found it useful and interesting. Uh, there's a new group called Timeless Veterinary Community where uh, if you can work through your local veterinarian, uh, they're able to get second opinions uh, through uh, the internet uh, and contact me and I'm able to help your veterinarians to be able to help you where you are. There's also a group called the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. So uh, if you know of any veterinarians or paraprofessionals that are interested in aquatics, make sure they join our World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association, which is made up of veterinarians from all around the world. And we've got representation from over 50 different countries. Um, and it's uh, the basically, yeah, it's a, a special area of veterinary medicine uh, where we need as much input into it so that we can develop and advance um, this area as much more as, as much as we can so yeah so that's it from me hope you enjoyed this presentation uh, make sure you check out our website thefishvet.com.au our youtube channel the fish doctor and also our our facebook page uh, i've got a couple uh, one of them is the fish vet dr low and also that's one the fish doctor so yeah make sure um, you say hello to me there and I'll try as much as possible to help you if I can. Um, just uh, be patient because I am really only one person. So, um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening. And I hope you were able to get something useful out of that talk. Thank you very much, Richmond. That was a highly informative talk. Uh, you know, it was like a class completely, you know. Uh, well, uh, on behalf of School of Industrial Fisheries, Cochin University of Science and Technology, I wish to thank you for your effort and enlightening us, as the whole audience the 1,500 participants who have uh, registered for the program for 40 countries. Yes, I feel all of them will be highly uh, you know, enlightened by your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's us, uh, wait for some questions. Shall we? Shall we, Richmond? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, John, would you like to ask something? Um, it's not. It's not really a question. Um, I mean, what Richmond's done is, uh, in an hour, he's given us a, a textbook's worth of um, the, an encyclopedia of fish diseases, which I think is very valuable to see actual photos of uh, of these diseases and. Uh, you know, their, their symptoms, even if they're not always, uh, um, you know, always treatable. Um, I'm fascinated, uh, always been fascinated by the effect that environmental conditions and nutrition have, uh, have on fish. And, uh, and Richmond, you've shown a few examples that, uh, well, the hypothermia one, uh, I mean, I've never seen pictures of fish suffering the primary or secondary effects of, uh, of hypothermia. So I found that extremely valuable. I also found uh, extremely valuable the fact that when you feed fish the, an improper diet, 
And there are all these things out there on the market of uh, foods for specific fish. And yet people will still say, oh, well, it's fish food, it's fish food. And it's not. <laughs> it's good for one, but not, not, not for another. So I found it very illuminating and uh, I just uh, wish, wish to extend a vote of thanks. All right. Thank you, John. Yeah, the, one of the interesting things is that um, when you're looking up books or the internet about um, diseases, most of them show you uh, diseases uh, that kill fish acutely, but um, there's not really a lot that show you what uh, subacute um, stress uh, different factors play on fish do to them. Um, and yeah, so I, I thought that was interesting to share. Jim? Jim? Would you like to unmute? Yeah. Now, uh, it, uh, you obviously didn't hear me. I said, yes, that, that, that is extremely valuable. And to actually see things live, you know, actually happening in front of, it, in front of your eyes, um, a common problem that many aquarists have is when we're talking about skin flukes and, uh, and gill flukes. So if it's a skin fluke, it's got to be on the skin. If it's a gill fluke, it's got to be on the gills. And how do you tell one from the other? Well, now they know, <laughs> they've seen it. Um, so all these things I found ex extremely valuable. Well, there are some questions from the audience. Uh, uh, there is Samiran Patra. He's asking about some remedial measures for ulcer diseases in catfishes. Do some tell them about uh, ulcer diseases in catfish. Um, well, uh, quite a few things that can cause ulcers. Uh, ammonia burn uh, can do that. Straight bacterial infection, so flavor bacteria and aromonas, and also skin flukes and lice. So. Really, you need to get a, a diagnosis of what is the primary cause of it. Um, so if you do a water quality test, you'll be able to rule that in or out. So it could be ammonia or um, low key H. Uh, then the next stage, you do a skin scrape of, of the fish and maybe a gill biopsy. Look at that down a microscope. If it's due to some sort of an external parasites, you'll be able to see that they're moving. Uh, if you rule all those out, then it's most likely going to be a, a straight bacterial cause. And, and then you would treat with antibiotics. But if it's a water quality issue, water changes and try to um, avoid that. So maybe your biofilter has died back. So try and work out uh, why that is the case. And if it's an external parasite, you treat um, for the external parasites. Um, so yeah, for example, if it was... Yeah, flukes, you may go with something like trichlorophon or a, a Prezi-Quantel treatment uh, for, for your fish. Jim has unmuted. There's a question uh, from uh, how lymphocyte uh, lymphocystis diseases can be treated in bioflux system. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure if lymphocystis can be treated. Um, anyway, there aren't really many antiviral drugs, and I don't know. Is um, are you thinking that the bioflux bacteria can degrade the virus? Maybe Tim might have uh, some input there, maybe? Um, actually, no. Um, I don't really, you know, I can't think of how uh, the, the bile flock would actually have any impact on the virus. 
I mean, typically with lymphocystis, you're, you know, you're trying to reduce stress. Sometimes that, that seems to cause a, the lesions to recede. I, I guess I don't really have anything to add. Right, thanks, Tim. Uh, Kapila, uh, Kapila would be asking yes, something. Uh, uh, no, I just uh, joined in from work. Uh, so it's okay, Mani. Yes. Got it. Yes. All right. Yeah. Can I? Can I come in? It's a. It's a question, Richard. Uh, we don't see them these days, um, but you remember the injected glassfish. Uh, that came in all sorts of, of, of colors. I actually witnessed the actual, the, the, the debagging of some of these shipments. And what was one of the things that was obvious was that uh, the injected fish were likely to carry, to carry lymphocystis or were more prone to lymphocystis. Um, I never got to the bottom of what, what, what the link was between the dyes and, and the virus itself. Do, do you know anything on that? Um, I guess with the injection of the dye, it causes them extreme stress. Um, mm. So, yeah, just jabbing the needle and, and perhaps um, the needle, they, they probably wouldn't change between fish. So they're basically um, one, one of the fish might be carrying the virus and then they just mm. inoculate more yeah. and more fish after that. Yeah. And um, those other ones that are acid dyed, um, so they strip off the protective um, mucus uh, that carries antibodies and other um, immune uh, things on, on their skin. Uh, stripping that off means that they're more vulnerable um, to getting a virus attack as well. So I think both could be both of those reasons. Yeah. Are you talking about now, uh, apart from the injected glassfish, are you talking about the tattooed fish that we've seen? With yeah, all this and tattoos, body yeah. 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 So thank you very much. I think if it was uh, the pandemic days are over, we would like to invite each one of you, Dr. Rishman Lo and all my uh, team of speakers to Cochin University of Science and Technology to be, have a formal conference, uh, formal trainings. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again. All right. Thank you, Edmund. Thank so you, Mini, for taking all the trouble. <laughs>